And everybody said, Good evening, everyone. Brothers and sisters, I really appreciate, and God appreciates your coming, even at this time. And the Lord will bless your faithfulness in Jesus' name. And um, as we speak on sanctification, we're not talking as if uh, we're not sanctified, but we have to go through the scriptures, just like when we talk about salvation. Even though we are saved, we still have to teach on salvation, not only for you, but for you to take that message uh, to the people that need to hear. And we'll be talking on sanctification for some time now. It's not because we're not sanctified, it's because we need to understand deep enough to be able to teach other people also. God give us understanding in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your faithful people. Thank you for our workers. Thank you for our leaders. And thank you for everyone that is so committed to you, coming every time and wanting to spread this word of the gospel. We're asking, Lord, that you give us greater understanding, deeper knowledge in the word of the Lord in Jesus' name. We pray that you lay your mighty hand upon your people. As we're sanctified, Lord, we pray you help us to abide in this experience in Jesus' name and help us to pass it to other people so that through us, this word will spread to more and more people in Jesus' name. Bless your people tonight and use us to bless the whole church and to bless the world around us. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. In John chapter 17, verse 17, John 17, verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself. I set myself apart. I consecrate myself. I hold onto the cross. I bear the cross. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. The word of God speaks often, very often, of sanctification because of its infinite value. This word of God, as we hold in our hands from Genesis to Revelation, speaks of this, not something like just a doctrine, but something we experience, something we possess. And the possession of that sanctification is greater and more profitable than the possession of all desirable things on the earth. Money, sanctification is greater, property, sanctification is greater, position, sanctification is greater, titles, sanctification is greater, family and marriage, sanctification is greater than all that, political power and influence or affluence, all these cannot be compared with this Christian experience of sanctification. It is infinite, infinitely valuable, inestimable value it has, and when we possess, when we live in it, we're going to have what nothing else could give us. Tonight, I'm talking to you on the great and infinite worth of sanctification. The great and infinite worth, infinite value of sanctification. As we look at Joshua chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 5. Joshua chapter 3, sanctification is valuable. Sanctification has a great worth and a great profit. It tells us in Joshua chapter 3 verse 5, And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Many people think that it's only to get to heaven, and that's why we need sanctification. We need to be holy so that we can get to heaven. That's true. But be above 
that or beyond that, before we get to that heaven, we need a lot of things here on earth. And sanctification is the road map. Sanctification is the express way for having all those things. Here it says, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Wonders will come upon your life. We're coming to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, and we're reading from verse 32. It says in verse 32, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the watch of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. You see here, it's talking about inheritance. There's a kind of inheritance we have. There's a kind of possession we have from the hand of the Lord, which we cannot have until we're sanctified. And so Paul the Apostle, by the Spirit of God says, I'm committing you to God and to the word of his grace and so that you'll be built up and then you'll have an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. In First Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 8, sanctification is essential, is important. Sanctification is profitable, not only to get to heaven, but even in this life, it is profitable. We're coming to First Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness, but holiness, but sanctification, or purity of heart, but a pure life is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. There are many things we have here on earth, very good things, important things, and things we cannot deal without that are only profitable on earth. You think about money, profitable on earth, not in heaven. You think about property, uh, profitable on earth and not in heaven. You think about other things that we have, desirable things, wonderful things and good things. They're good for us here and we benefit from them here. But holiness goes beyond that. Sanctification goes beyond that. It is profitable here on earth and then profitable also in the life which is to come. As I said, we're talking about the great and infinite wars of sanctification. Why is it so great? Why is it so important? Why is it indispensable? And why does it have this infinite value and worth? Number one, because it's a command of God. Number one, the command of sanctification. The command that we must be sanctified. That's why it's great. God has commanded it. That's why it's infinite. The infinite God has commanded that we must be sanctified. It tells us in Leviticus chapter 20, verses 7 and 8, Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God, and ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. In verse 7, it says, you have a, a part to play, sanctify yourselves. And then in verse 8, it says, ultimately, I'm the one to sanctify you. And that sanctification like salvation is an instantaneous experience. We don't get saved little by little. We don't get sanctified little by little. Whatever God wants to do, he can do it instantaneously. And he says, I am the Lord who sanctifies you. He commands it. That's why it's infinite. Number one, the command of sanctification. Number two, the cost of sanctification. You know how valuable something is, how worthy something is by the cost, by the price you pay for that thing. And number two, this sanctification is of great value and it's of infinite value because of the cost of sanctification. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 13 and I'm reading here from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 12, where for Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without a gate. He laid down his life. 
He, he died on the cross of Calvary. He shed his blood for you and for me. That's the cost of our sanctification. It must be of great value. It must be of a great worth because of that great cost of sanctification. Number three, the condition for sanctification. The condition for sanctification. Uh, you know how valuable something is when you have to, you know, pay a price. So you have to do something. You have to fulfill a condition. If it's for every Dick and Harry, and we don't have to do anything, you know, that is a common experience. But no, this one sanctification is uh, having condition. I'm coming to John chapter 17. John chapter 17 i'm reading from verse 14 i have given them thy word and the world has hated them you see that we have received the word of god and we stay in that word of god hatred comes persecution comes and we stay there because we're waiting for something because if we backslide, if we compromise, we cannot go through to sanctification. It says, I've given them the word, and the world has hated them because they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Before it comes to our sanctification, it says there's a condition. We come out of the world. We come out of the things of the world, the things we used to love, and the things we used to partake of. We cannot go on in them. We come out of the world world so that we can have this experience of sanctification look at verse 15 i pray not that that thou shouldest take them out of the world but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil is a condition there he keeps us from evil so that we can eventually as we pray as we trust the lord we can be sanctified he says in verse 16 they are not of the world even as i am not of the world after that now the prayer sanctify them through thy truth the word is truth number one the command of sanctification number two the cost of sanctification Number three, the condition for sanctification. Number four, the consecration for sanctification. It's not like, you know, God, you want to sanctify me. Do it when you want to and how you want to. No, we must bring everything we have and lay it on the altar. There is consecration. There is submission to the will of God. It tells us in Romans chapter 12, reading from verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The consecration for sanctification. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, we're already brethren, we're already children of God, we're already brothers and sisters in Christ. It says, by the mercies of God, that she present your bodies a living sacrifice. This consecration, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. That's a command for us because we have got the mercy of salvation, the mercy of forgiveness, and the mercy of peace with God. By those mercies of God, we now come to lay everything upon the altar. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Number five, the consequence of sanctification. What happens? It sanctifies us, it purifies us. For what purpose? And what do we get after that? The consequence of sanctification. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it. You see that? He gave himself. He sacrificed himself. He submitted to the death of the cross of Calvary so that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. He doesn't just want an ordinary church, a nominal church, an unclean church, a sinful church. He doesn't want a, even just a saved church. He wants a glorious church, not having sports, not having a wrinkle or any such thing, but that the church should be holy and without blemish. 
the consequence of sanctification when he sanctifies us we're holy through and through in the heart in the mind in purpose in plan in everything that we do and then we become glorious enough to be taken to heaven and then why is this sanctification so important and so, uh, so uh, indispensable, number six, the condemnation without sanctification. The condemnation without sanctification. Uh, the people who trample upon the word of sanctification, and you say, I don't have anything to do with that. There is condemnation without sanctification. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 29. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, of how much sore punishment. Suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood wherewith he was sanctified and unholy sin. He despises sanctification. He despises the word of sanctification. And it says uh, he counts that as an holy sin and he has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For ye know him that has said, Vengeance is mine, vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, says the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. Verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The one who toys with sanctification, the one who despises sanctification, the one who throws away sanctification, the one who tramples upon the sanctifier, the Lord Jesus Christ, he says it's a fearful thing when he falls into the hands of the living God. Number seven, the compensation for sanctification. We go to the Lord, we lay everything upon the altar, we are consecrated to God, submissive to God, and he sanctifies us. He compensates that. He rewards that because that is his will the compensation for sanctification it tells us in hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 through to verse 11. hebrews chapter 2 reading from verse 9 but we we'll see jesus was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of god should taste death for every man he has tasted death for every man for you for me for our neighbors for our relatives for everyone and then he goes on for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory many sons to glory he saves us so he can bring us to glory then he sanctifies us so that we can be fit for that glory he says to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering for both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one he unites us with Christ. He identifies us with Christ. He says, Christ is my beloved son. He says, your beloved son. He says, Christ pleases me all the time. And he says, because you are sanctified and you are living the sanctified life, we are all of one with the Lord Jesus Christ and we please him. He says, for which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren. Brothers and sisters, sanctification is very important. Sanctification is indispensable. Sanctification has great value, has infinite worth. And that's the reason why everyone ought to have this experience and keep this experience and live by this experience. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, there is will in our sanctification and holiness. This is his will that will be sanctified. This is his will that we be holy. His will in our sanctification and holiness. Number two, the wonder of sanctification in the harvest. As we go to the harvest field, God will work with us. As we go to the harvest field, we're preaching the word, we're helping people, we're counseling people. He will honor our word and he will answer our prayers for the people because of that sanctification, the wonder of sanctification in the harvest. Point number three, the way through sanctification to heaven the way through sanctification 
to heaven. We cannot go to heaven any other way. We cannot have a bypass. We cannot have a shortcut. We cannot have another way to get to heaven without going through sanctification. The way through sanctification to heaven. Point number one is will in our sanctification and holiness. This is the will of God. The will of God for me, the will of God for you, the will of God for every believer. Let's come to First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. And there are some, there are some times, uh, you know, we're asking for something and we're seeking for something. And just about the time we're about to get it, it slips away from us. And then we try again and we say, yes, I'm going to pray. I've been hearing about this sanctification and I've been learning about this sanctification and then we pray, we consecrate and we're trying to believe, have faith in God that this work will be done in us and then it slips away from us. Then we say, well, maybe this thing is not for me. Yes, it's for you. It's the will of God. It's just like somebody saying, I prayed for salvation and I didn't get it. Maybe it's not for me. Yes, it's for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's like somebody asking for healing. Oh Lord, heal me. I have this ailment. I have this challenge. And the healing will not come a day or two days or one week or two weeks. And the fellow says, maybe the healing is not for me. Yes, it's for you. He has promised that he will heal us by his stripes. We're healed. The same thing for sanctification. You cannot say, maybe it's not for me because I prayed for it before and it doesn't appear. I'm getting, you know, any headway. It will happen. The Lord will sanctify everyone who consecrates and believes in the Lord for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Look at verse 7. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He has called you to holiness. He has called you to sanctification. It will be fulfilled in your life, fulfilled in my life fulfilled in our church for every one of us in Jesus name Leviticus chapter chapter 20 and the will of God is the command of God he never commands what he does not will if he doesn't want you to have something he cannot command that he will not command that if he commands it that is his will Leviticus chapter 20 verse 7 it says sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy. Holiness is the will of God for everyone. Sanctification is the will of God for everyone. For I am the Lord your God. You see your God? I am the Lord your God. He will do it in every life. And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. It tells us in um, First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, what he told the Old Testament people, be ye holy for I am holy. This is what he's telling us too in the New Testament. It tells us in First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 15, but as see which has called you is holy, so be ye holy. In all manner of conversation, he says, because God is a holy God, he lives in a holy heaven. His angels are holy. And when Lucifer became unholy, and when those angels, fallen angels, have followed Lucifer, when they became unholy, he drove them away from heaven. And when Adam and Eve became unholy, he drove them away from the garden of Eden. He wants everyone to be holy. He ordains everyone to be holy. He commands everyone to be holy. It is the will of God. And that is what makes us to live in fellowship with him. And it says over there, because he's holy, then we ought to be holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, 
and we're going to follow what is written it's not what people say it's what people it's not what people doubt it's not what people contradict they might contradict this and contradict that they might even write books and write uh, whatever it is that contradicts holiness but the word of God makes it very clear and what is written in the word is the will of God for us it says because it is written be ye holy for I am holy it will happen as we believe the Lord the Lord will not deny himself he will not deny his promise he will not deny his word holiness is the will of God for everyone sanctification is the will of God for everyone look at this illustration so you can understand what we're talking about when we talk about the will of God being our sanctification is second Chronicles chapter 29 Second Chronicles chapter 29, I'm reading from verse 5. Second Chronicles chapter 29, and we're reading from verse 5. It says in verse 5, and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, look at this now, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers. Sanctify yourselves, that's one thing, sanctify the house of the Lord. God of your fathers. Why are they connected? Because we are the temple of God. Because we are the house of God. Because we are the habitation of God. Because he wants to dwell in us. He wants to live in us. And the same sanctification he talks about for the temple, for the house of God, the physical, literal house, the same thing he's talking about concerning the temple. Read that again. And said unto, and said unto them, hear me. Ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of God, of, of the God of your fathers. Look at what it means. And carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. Carry forth the filthiness, carry out, take out, remove all filthiness from the holy place and when we're sanctified that's exactly what happens everything on holy thought word everything on holy plan the deliberations everything on holy it takes away from us out of the temple of god we're coming to verse 15 of that same chapter and they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. What sanctification is cleansing? In what cleansing? It cleanses our mind, it cleanses our heart, it cleanses our spirit, it cleanses the inner man. And when it cleanses the when you clean the house of God, cleanse the house of God. That's the sanctification for the house of God. And when you are cleansed internally, when you are cleansed in your mind, and then your mind, your heart, your conscience becomes as clean as the heart and the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the sanctification. Look at verse 16. And the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it. The outward was already clean, but now the inward part. In our lives, when we're saved, our outward life is cleansed. All the cheating and the lying and the stealing and the adultery and fornication and the smoking, the drinking, external things, all those things are gone. But in sanctification, the inward part now needs to be cleansed. They went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it. And they brought out all the uncleanness that, they, that were found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it to carry it out abroad into the brook Kidron. That means the thing is totally removed. The thing is totally taken away. And the Lord does that today. You remember, we are the temple of God now. And he wants that temple to be holy. He wants that temple to be pure. He wants that temple to be sanctified. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 
reading here from verse 16 it says uh, know ye not that she at the temple of god what you read about in the old testament the house of god the temple of god cleanse that take the unclean thing and take the filthy thing out of that house of god it comes to the new testament it says are you looking for a physical temple to cleanse it's now you are now the temple of god and it says that the spirit of god dwells in you we're now the inner chamber inside us where the holy ghost is dwelling now it says if any man defile the temple of god him shall god destroy for the temple of god is tell me out aloud holy which temple ye are he wants us to be holy as the temple of god not just outwardly salvation gives us that righteousness externally it is sanctification that gives us this holiness and this state and this nature of uh, holiness on the inside he wants us so he tells us in second corinthians chapter seven second corinthians chapter seven already in chapter six it talks about salvation uh, go back to the last two verses of chapter 6. It says, Wherefore come out from among them, and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. That's salvation. That's salvation. We become children of God. We're born again. I will refer to as the sons and the daughters of God. Now it goes on in chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, were dearly beloved because we we're born again. It says, Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, outward, inward, cleansing, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The Lord will do it. We're looking at Luke chapter 1. This is what himself, what he had promised. The holiness we have within. The sanctification we have within. It tells us in Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 73. The oath which is swear to our fathers, if our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we've been delivered out of the hand of our enemies, that's uh, outward, that's external. The enemies are outward, the uh, Philistines or Canaanites or the Jebusites. He will deliver us from those Assyrians and the Babylonians, outward deliverance. Then it says, the young Dutch outward deliverance from enemies that might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him how long all the days of our life you see salvation alone people get saved and then they sometimes backslide or they yield to temptation backsliding does not mean that they left the church backsliding does not mean they stopped reading the bible Backsliding does not mean that they are not for, uh, they are not calling themselves by the name of God anymore, but they fall into sin privately, and then they repent again, and later they fall into sin and they repent again. But the Lord is saying uh, He sanctifies us, and He takes the propensity of falling, He takes all that away. He so cleanses us, and He so establishes His holiness within us that we serve Him in holiness and righteousness before Him. Him. tell me again for how long all the days of our life he is able I said he is able he will do it in Jesus name for a true child of God there is not there's uh, no greater reason uh, for seeking and receiving sanctification than this that it is the will of God even if he doesn't do anything any other thing uh, why am I seeking sanctification? It's the will of God. Why do I want to be sanctified? It's the will of God. Why do I want to keep to this sanctification? It is to, it's the will of God. And so there's no other reason we need. Once it's the will of God, we must have it. You'll have it in Jesus' name. It's for this reason we desire it. It's the will of God. It's for this reason we pray for it. It is uh, the will of God. It's for this reason we don't stop until we experience it. Because 
the will of God is not totally fulfilled in my life until I experience this. It is the will of God. I must obtain it. I must live in it in the experience without compromise. And then think about a worker. Think about a preacher. Think about a minister. For a true minister of God, there is no higher motive for preaching sanctification except that it's the will of God. Why are you preaching sanctification? It's the will of God. I must preach it because it says that will be done here on earth as it is done in heaven. And why are we emphasizing sanctification? Because it is the will of God. They say, look at all the other preachers. They emphasize this. They emphasize this. They emphasize that. Many of those things other people are emphasizing is not the will of God for everyone. But there's something we know for sure that this is the will of God for everyone in his kingdom. And because we're sure of that, that's why we're earnestly contending for this. That's why we're constantly preaching this. That's why we're always upholding it. That's why we're defending it. That's why we're preserving it. That's why we're earnestly contending for that which has been delivered once for all unto the saints. It must happen in every member of our church. Sanctification. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And I'm reading here from verses 12 and 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verses 12 and 13. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love. One toward another. And toward all men. Even as we do toward you. To the end for the purpose. He may establish your hearts. Unblameable in holiness before God. Unblameable in holiness before God. It's not just before me. It's not just before our neighbors. It's not just before our friends. It's not just before our co-workers in the office. Even before the Almighty God, He makes us unblameable in holiness. Even our even before our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. Chapter five. I'm reading from verse 22. Chapter 5, verse 22. Abstain from what? All appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. He can do it. And he will do it. And when it is done, it can preserve us in that holiness. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ faithful is he our God is faithful is faithful to save is faithful to sanctify is faithful to heal is faithful to sanctify is faithful to all his promises is faithful this is one of his promises that the God of peace will sanctify you holy in your body, in your soul, in your spirit, and will preserve you in that righteousness, holiness, in what holiness, sanctification, until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has given the promise, he is faithful, he will do it. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. He will do it in every life. We come to point number two now, the wonder of sanctification in the harvest the wonder of sanctification in the harvest many people you know they, they might have the erroneous idea well uh, when i'm ready to go to heaven and when it's about for the lord to call me to heaven when i'm old and i know that it may not be long now and then i need to prepare for heaven that sanctification i will seek it well, to start with, that's a dangerous uh, kind of attitude because you don't know when death will come. Young people die, middle-aged people die, and older people also die. And so, if you're going to seek for sanctification, it is now. But it's beyond just about heaven. 
I want to go to heaven, so I must be sanctified. That's true, that's true. But then, look at this. Because of your being profitable in the kingdom, profitable for the harvest, profitable in the work of the Lord. That's why you must also be sanctified. Point number two, the wonder of sanctification in the harvest. Come to Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 5. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Uh, Joshua must have remembered the words of the Lord in Leviticus. He heard it when Moses said it. And many people that were not sanctified, they died in the wilderness. They couldn't get to the wonder of the land of Canaan. Now they were about to enter the land of Canaan. And it was a great wonder. God was going to open River Jordan for them. That was a great wonder. God was going to strike at the heart of the Canaanites and make them so afraid. They will be so wicked. They will not run after the children of Israel. That was to be a great wonder. God was going to tell them to be circumcised in the physical. And even in the physical, when they were circumcised, all the Canaanites will not have the idea. Now they are weak because of circumcision. Let us say, uh, pounce on them let us destroy them that was to be a great wonder and joshua said now as we are entering the land of canaan it's going to be a wonder upon wonder upon wonder and before we can get to those wonders sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the lord will do wonders among you and let's look at joshua chapter one joshua chapter one i'm reading from verse three Every place the soul of your foot shall tread upon that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. But you see that wonder that every place the soul of their foot shall tread upon will be theirs. They could not possess without being sanctified. Look at verse 5. Another wonder. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee. I will not forsake thee. That wonder of not, uh, being, uh, not being captured by anybody, oppressed by anybody, and they always overcame, uh, that wonder would not happen except they were sanctified. Look at Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7, we're looking at verse 13. In Joshua chapter 7, verse 13, uh, they went to a particular city. And they thought it was a small city. And this one will run over this one. Will conquer this one. Will possess this one. And they forgot sanctification at that time. And it was a great surprise to Joshua that as the people went, the Lord was not with them. And uh, so 36 of them were killed. They lost their lives unnecessarily because the wonders, every place the soul of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, no man shall be able to stand before you. It's not automatic. You must sanctify yourself so that it will do great wonders among you. Chapter 7, verse 13. Chapter 7, verse 13. Oh, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed sin in the midst of thee, O Israel, and thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed sin from among you. You see that there was an accursed sin in their midst. And they just thought the promise of God is there, the power of God is there, it's going to give us wonder. We're going to trample upon those enemies. Sanctification is uh, the root cause of that victory. Look at verse 11. Israel have sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, 
which I commanded them, for they have even taken of their cursed sin, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put each even among their own stock. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Look at this now. Look at this very important. Neither, neither will I be with you anymore except she destroy the accursed sin from among you. You see that lack of sanctification will hinder our prayers. Lack of sanctification will hinder the uh, wonders that God wants to do as you go on the harvest field. As you're preaching to other people, as you're casting out devils, as you lay your hands on the sick that they will recover. If I regard any, any evil sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Sanctification is very important. We're coming to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, and I'm reading here from verse 5. Isaiah chapter 6. We're reading from verse 5. It tells us in chapter 5, chapter 6, verse 5, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean, of unclean leaves, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean leaves. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a life coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy leaves, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. That was his own sanctification. His sin was purged. His heart was purged. His, leave, his leaves were cleansed. And then it was only after that that the Lord said, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. There's a limitation to your ministry if you are not sanctified. And there is a kind of a ceiling on your outreach, on your harvesting, on your winning of souls, on your ministry, working for the Lord, if you're not sanctified. It was after Isaiah here was sanctified that they had the voice of the Lord, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And he said, here am I, send me. And when you think about the harvest field, we cannot go to the harvest field with, uh, without sanctification in our heart because the Lord will not walk fully wholeheartedly with us. In Matthew chapter 9, the harvest is there. It's talking about evangelism. The harvest is there. It's talking about harvesting souls into the kingdom. But we need sanctification if we're going to do it effectively and profitably. It tells us in Matthew chapter 9, reading from verse 36. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted, and they were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then says he to his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, many souls to be saved, having hearts to be softened and habitual sinners eh, to be jolted and brought into the gospel. And there are sinners that don't even care for salvation, but it is when sanctified vessels, sanctified preachers, you go to them and you tell them something will, will knock their hard heart, and something will break their stony heart, and something will pinch them, pierce them, and something will prick their heart. It says, the laborers are few. Then it says in verse 38, but uh, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send laborers into his harvest, into the, his harvest. Send laborers into his harvest. What do we need before we actually do the work effectively like Jesus did? Come back to John chapter 17. John chapter 17, reading from verse 17 and verse 18. 
John chapter 17, verses 17 and 18. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Immediately after prayer, after that prayer of sanctification, it says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. As thou hast sent me to the world to save them, to bring them out of their sin, and to present salvation to them, and to present the goodness and the love of God to them, even so have I sent them after he prayed for sanctification. Look at verse 21. That they all may be one. One was sanctified, were one with one another, and were one with Jesus Christ, the sanctifier. It says that they all may be one, as thou Father art in me, and I, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. That sanctification, look at what follows, and the world, and that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. If there's no sanctification, if there is, you know, this argument, and if there's carnal comparison, if we have in fighting, and if we have indignation with one another, like those disciples had before they were sanctified, it, the world will not believe what are we coming into, and what are we going to believe. But when we're sanctified, and we're all one, and we're all united, it says the world will believe that thou hast sent me. God will use us. It will use you. It will use me. Use us in winning more souls to the Lord in Jesus' name. That's why we need sanctification. Uh, without sanctification, the ministers of God and the preachers and the workers will lack divine assistance. Divine assistance will be withdrawn. That's what happened in Joshua chapter 7. Without sanctification, victory will be lost. That's what happened in Joshua chapter 7. Without sanctification, the harvest field will be wasted. Backsliders and sinners will die without assurance. You see, they went to Ai and they wanted to conquer Ai, but 36 of them lost their lives and they went to eternity without assurance because there was no sanctification. Without sanctification, we lack unity and the world will continue in unbelief. But Jesus has sanctified them and make them one that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Without sanctification, prayer for others remain ineffective. We pray for other people. Lord, save them. It's ineffective because we're not sanctified. Lord, heal them. It's ineffective because we're not sanctified. We cannot cast out the devils because we're not sanctified. And many things will be waiting because people, the preachers and the workers are not sanctified. So winning efforts will yield no abiding fruit. Yes, we're laboring. Yes, we're going out and we're trying to win so into the kingdom, but if our hearts are not sanctified, the Lord will not work with us, and the ready ripened harvest will be eternally lost. They are ready to be saved, but the people who are to get to them to get them saved so that God will work with us and bring them into the kingdom. If we're not ready, we're not sanctified, that harvest will be wasted. We're coming to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 20. In Mark chapter 16, reading from verse 20, it says, and they went forth, and they preached everywhere, the Lord walking with them. The Lord walking with them. Two cannot walk together except they be agreed. And we're in total agreement with God when we're sanctified. We're in unity with Christ, the sanctifier, when we're sanctified. But if that unity is not there, if there's disconnection between us and the sanctifier, if there's disconnection between us and the mighty one who is going to walk with us, then many souls will be lost, and those who are to be, to be healed cannot be healed. But in their own case, the Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following. It will happen in our lives. Uh, you see, as we talk about the wonders that attend sanctification, what are the wonders that attend sanctification? Number one, the wonder of convicting sinners. 
the wonder of convicting sinners. Your heart is pure. Your heart is right. Your heart is holy. Your spirit is sanctified. And he puts the word in your mouth. And you speak the word. Sinners will be convicted. Number two, the wonder of converting souls. They are, they are convicted. They are prayed in their hearts. And they are asking men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? And then you tell them, repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. In, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 did that. And they were converted. The wonder of converting sinners. Number three, the wonder of curing sicknesses. The wonder of curing sicknesses. It will be very easy. Silver and gold have I none. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. More miracles will be taking place in our midst in Jesus' name. When we're all sanctified, the preacher is sanctified, the workers are sanctified, the supportive ministries are sanctified, and then unitedly we say, come out, that evil spirit must come out. That incurable disease must be healed. Number one, the wonder of convicting sinners. Number two, the wonder of converting souls. Number three, the wonder of curing sicknesses. Number four, the wonder of casting out spirits. Casting out spirits. Because when you go to cast out spirits, do you remember the seven sons of Scavers that came and said, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preached, Come out, of the, come out of him. And then the evil spirit said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And he leaped on them and drove them out of that house. But when you are sanctified, and when Satan has nothing to accuse you of, and the power of God is flowing, there will be the wonder of casting out devils. If you have not cast out devils before, it will come to your turn, you will do it. Number five, the wonder of casting down strongholds. Casting down strongholds where other people have gone and they have preached and they have labored and the people were just looking at them because there were strongholds there. When you are sanctified, when you are purified and your faith is sanctified, your faith is purified, your heart is purified, everything coming out of you will come with the power of God and those strongholds will be cast down in Jesus' name. Number six is the wonder of conserving saints. The wonder of conserving saints. Many times this person says, yes, I believe, we pray together, and I believe Jesus is my Savior. And then you go back to them, and you are thinking now oh, they will come with you. But they say, no, I have my church. No, I have changed my mind. No, I don't feel like that now. But you see, when we're sanctified, and our prayers are irresistible, our ministries are irresistible, there'll be the the wonder of convert of conserving saints and then number seven there'll be the wonder of connecting the supernatural the wonder of connecting the supernatural there'll be no uh, gap between you and the supernatural and there'll be no break no uh, short circuit uh, between you and the supernatural you will connect to the supernatural and great will be uh, your effectiveness in ministry in jesus name that's why it tells uh, the workers the leaders the preachers we need sanctification we must have sanctification not only to get to heaven yes it's necessary to get to heaven with sanctification but also that we may be effective in ministry it tells us in second timothy chapter 2 second timothy chapter 2 reading from verse 21 Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor. You will be a vessel unto honor. All of us will be vessels unto honor. Sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared for every good work. It will use you more and more. It will use you effectively. Let's remember the harvest, and because of the harvest, let's make sure we lay everything upon the altar. Look at Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 24. Jeremiah chapter 5, we're reading from verse 24. Neither say they in their heart, let us not fear the Lord our God, that giveth rain, both the former and the latter. 
in a season he reserves unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Before the Lord comes, he wants us to harvest the harvest of the world, bring souls into the kingdom so that none of the sinners around us will say what the people said in Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 20. Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 20. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. But so when us have gone out, and so when us have preached, and so when us have touched the lives of many people, and yet many people in our communities, this is their cry. The harvest is about ending. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. As we get sanctified, and we keep that sanctification and the holiness of the Lord is within our hearts and we ourselves will become holiness unto the Lord will reach out and the harvest will be reaped into the kingdom in Jesus name a good amen, amen. point number three now the way through sanctification to heaven after you've done a good work here, after you've served the Lord wholeheartedly here, then at the end, that same sanctification will open the doors of heaven for you. I'm talking about you there. You will get to heaven in Jesus' name. Look at John chapter 17. John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, the word is truth. Verse 21, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Verse 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. I will that all those who have given me, I'm praying for them now they'll be sanctified. I'm praying for them now they'll be holy. And the reason I'm praying for them is so that all of them will be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou hast loved me before the foundation of the world, is to help us get to heaven. Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for the church, for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Look at the purpose, look at the reason, that he might present it to himself that he might present he to himself as a bride to the bridegroom so that they would live together the church the glorious church and christ that he might present he to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing you know, but that he should be holy and without blemish after he has sanctified us then he takes us all to heaven you didn't hear that one we will be there. I will be there. I will be there. Nothing will take your name away from that place. Look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. You see that? That he might sanctify us with his own blood. It's not a struggling that, that sanctifies us. It's not our own effort that sanctifies us. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. It says, let us go forth therefore unto him without the cap bearing his reproach. Why? For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Because we're seeking that heavenly city and we want to get there and we're going to get there. That's the reason why he says he shed his blood so that we can be sanctified. It takes both salvation plus sanctification for us to make heaven our home at last. Um, we're reading from 
Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. It says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? It's talking about those who will go to heaven. The, play, the people that will abide in heaven eventually. Here is the qualification. Here is what feeds us for heaven in verse 4. He that has clean hands, the salvation, and a pure heart, the sanctification. Those who are going to get to heaven and those who are going to abide with the almighty God in heaven forever and ever. He that has clean hands, they are saved and they have made necessary restitution and a pure heart, they are sanctified and their hearts are made holy. Who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. It tells us in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 8. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's what it takes. Pure in heart, sanctified. The pure in heart, those are sanctified people, and those are the people that will see God. I will be of that number. I said, I will be of that number. <laughs> Nothing will deny you in Jesus' name. We're coming to Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 11. Second Peter chapter 3. We're reading here from verse 11. It tells us in verse 11, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what uh, the Lord is revealing to us here is that all the houses and all the properties and all the certificates and all the things, tangible things that we see, all the substances, all the materials, they'll be burnt up in fire. It says, um, what manner of persons ought she to be in all holy conversation and godliness looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. All the things people are running after. I must get this. I'll get saved later. I must get this. I'll get sanctified later. I must get this. All those things will be burnt up. Everything totally burnt up. All the things that people are passionate about. All the things that people are almost dying to get. Everything will be totally burnt up. But it says in verse 13, nevertheless, we, according as his promise, look for new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness wherefore beloved seeing that she look for such things be diligent that she may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless without spot and blameless that's sanctification it says if we're going to see him on that final day and we're going to be partakers of that glorious uh, provision of the lord we must be without spot and blameless thank god it will count you worthy it will count me worthy i'll be worthy i will be worthy you'll be worthy in jesus name nothing will stain your garment Nothing will stain your life. Nothing will take this sanctification away from your heart in Jesus' name. You'll preach it. You'll possess it. You'll bring others into the experience in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 4. Thou hast a few names, even in studies, which have not defiled their garments. They are not getting saved and backsliding. They are not, uh, you know, being cleansed and going to pollution again. They keep themselves by the grace of God in this holiness and sanctification. In uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 4, thou hast a few names, even in studies, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. They are worthy. Who are the people among this they? Worthy, the Lord will do it. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. He will not blot out your name. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Look at uh, chapter 7. 
and I'm reading from verse 9. Chapter 7 from verse 9. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds, some people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palms in their hands. There are so many no, no man could number them. If there are so many that get saved, if there are so many that get sanctified, you'll be there. You must be there. If other people, it says in all nations, in all kingdoms, among all people, among all tongues, if they are getting it, it will be unfortunate. If you don't get it, you must get it. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four living creatures, the bees, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Bless, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these? Who are these? Who are arrayed in white robes? White robes. White robes. That's the sanctification. That's the holiness. And where, where, whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. Tribulation did not uh, take the sanctification from them. Troubles, trials, temptation and difficulties, oppression, persecution did not take their sanctification away from them. Problems will not take your sanctification from you. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more neither thirst anymore neither the sun neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat and the, for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and lead them unto the fountains of waters and god shall and god shall don't worry today about the weeping, about the crying, about the sorrow. Everything the Lord will wipe away. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, from our eyes, from your eyes. Revelation chapter 19, I'm reading here from verse 6. Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice. And give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. It's not automatic. His wife, the bride, the church, has made herself ready. You will be ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, sanctification, clean and white, holiness, clean and white, purity of heart. For the linen, fine linen, is the righteousness of the saints. What of those who are not clean and white? What of those who are polluted? Look at Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. But the fearful... I will not be fearful. I said, I will not be fearful, but the fearful and the unbelieving, I will not be unbelieving. And the abominable, I will not be abominable. Say it for yourself. And the murderers, I will not be a murderer. And the whoremongers, I will not be an, a whoremonger. And the sorcerers, I will not be. And the idolaters, I will not be. And all liars, thank God I will not be a liar. I said, thank God I will not be a liar. 
They shall have their part in the liquid bonnet with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Look at verse 27. And I shall in no wise enter into it anything, anyone that defileth, neither whatsoever walketh abomination, or maketh a lie, manufactures a lie, and tells that lie. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Your name will be in the book of life. Amen. I pray the Lord will never take your name away from them. We're coming to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22 verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments. That they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Will you be there? For without are dogs and sorcerers and all mongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. And he says, and the bride and the morning star, the, and the spirit says, and the bride say, come. We can still come into salvation. We can come into sanctification. We can come into the blessings of the Lord. He'll make us ready. The bride, the spirit, and the bride say, come. And let him that hear us say, come. And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Everyone that calls upon the name of the Lord today will be answered. Salvation is free. Sanctification is free. Cleansing is free. And having this white robe is free. The Lord will do it for everyone. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now and say, Lord, thank you for your promise. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for this uh, sanctification. And as you have, if you have got it, praise the Lord, you have got it. If you want to be very sure that it is there and nothing can deny you of getting to heaven and being effective in the harvest and this holiness is stamped in your heart, you can pray and tell the Lord, oh Lord, here I am. Do it and establish it and establish me in it and I will do it for you in Jesus' name. And then the power to go out, the purity to go out and be an effective witness, a soul winner, harvester, reaping the harvest. Tell the Lord to you, the Lord will do it in every one of our lives. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Open your mouth and pray unto the Lord. It's another opportunity to check 